you can tell her, you can tell her anything, she's a real good listener, you can tell her anything. Yo, what's up, confidants? It's your girl, Father Longlegs. This is Teresa Lee. You're listening to You Can Tell Me Anything. This is the podcast where, well, in the past, comedians would confess something they want to get off their chest. But you guys know this is the quarantine edition. I've really been expanding my horizons, and I'm really excited to be um, talking to this guest today because she was actually the center of a a big uh, TikTok Twitter story that I happened to chance upon because I've been stealthily stalking the Trump bots. And uh, basically, we'll, we'll get into her story in a bit and I'll have her explain it. But she um, was doxxed and trolled by some extreme right wing memers, um, some of them pretty high profile and uh, lost her job at Deloitte and kind of pu- pu- publicly talked about it. And I think oh, and, and for posting about the Black Lives Matter movement. So um, I'm, we're here to talk about her story. We'll get into that. This is the first time we're talking. Um, but she uh, is on TikTok at Clara Janover. It's Clara Janover. How are you? Hi, how are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, yeah, as you said in your introduction, basically my recent claim and rise to public fame has been um, I've made a lot of TikTok con- content about Black Lives Matter. And one of them was picked up by Jack Posobiec, a very prominent conservative right wing troll. Mm-hmm. Um, with almost a million followers. And that catapulted a lot of right wing conservatives to go to my TikTok profile and find a separate video from over a month ago, um, where I used an analogy, I used a, you know, rhetorical (laughs) hyperbole to get a point across. Um, The exact thing, you know, was the next person who says all lives matter, or the next person who has the caucasity, which is the white audacity to say all lives matter, um, I'm going to stab you. And then while you're bleeding, I'm going to point to my paper cut and say, my cut matters too. And it was posted over a month ago. It didn't mm-hmm. raise any red flags. It wasn't, you know, a danger warning. It still isn't a danger warning. But that was picked up by very literal, older, 40-year-old conservatives <laughs> on Twitter. Which is very creepy it- that there's that many 40-year-old uh, angry men on TikTok. Wait, I really do want to get into your story, but just before we, because um, I know that once we start, we're going to open up the can of worms. So that's the little teaser. Um, but I want to highlight a couple of things before, because I know you've kind of, pub- like, just for anyone who's not familiar with the story, it's been written about all over. It's like on New York Post, Fox News. You've had celebrities spoke speaking out for you as well. Um, and as of now, today, when I looked, uh, you have 9.3 million likes on TikTok, which is very impressive. Uh, I am a millennial and old, an elderly woman, so you know that's beyond fathomable for me. Um, but uh, before we get into the story, I, I just just to start on a positive note, this is the thing I do with all my guests. I like to ask for a positive confession, and it's really really loose. It's like a humble brag. It could be something you're into, something you're excited about, just or something good that happened. Just like a quick little icebreaker, just so we can start on a positive note. Is there something yeah. good you want to confess? I mean, so I grew up in urban poverty in New Haven with my single mother who recently passed away, but I got into Harvard totally randomly, like not expected at all, got a full ride and have been there for the past like four years and it has changed my life forever and has made the world that I have possible for me in the future so magnificently possible. Um, that it's something that is both a brag, but also such a humbling experience. <laughs> That's awesome. I can tell you're very well spoken, um, very intimidating. I feel like my mom would like you as a daughter. Um, I did not get into Harvard. No, but that, that's very amazing. Um, yeah, I did look at some of your old TikToks. And what I really like about, I mean, we'll probably get into, the, I'm sure you'll speak on this more, but um, I watched one of your intro ones where you do, you know, like other stats and you said you like psychology. And I don't know if this came from studying psychology, but one of the things um, my therapist has told me about, like, as a tool for self-parenting is to have a conversation with yourself. And you do that a lot in your TikTok. Actually, the Black Lives Matter one was a conversation with yourself. But then there are other ones that are very funny and um, very, like, relevant that aren't Black Lives Matter related. So I wanted to highlight one just because I know that everyone's talking about, you know, the one that Jack posted. There was one where you have a conversation with yourself about having platonic guy friends. And as like a, you know, a, a woman in your early 20s, I felt like that was very mature and like insightful because 
that's definitely, you know, when I was, <laughs> I feel like I'm d very much dating myself, but I'm older than you. And when I was your age, I definitely don't think I thought those complex thoughts through as much, but you, you actually call yourself out and say, I think about this a lot and then criticize or like take apart your own logic in a way that I think is really elegant. Um, and that's something my therapist taught me. So I'm curious what spawned that format, if that's something that you just came to on your own or if that was through studying psychology? Uh, therapy, psychology as well. Um, I also grew up with a single mom and I'm an only child. So I had a lot of time in my own head. So deconstructing or reevaluating um, perspective is something that has been very crucial to who I am regardless. And psychology really helped me develop the tools in terms of critical thinking and perspective building. But again, even like when I first made my TikTok, it was a huge, just like kind of joke. I mean, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm only 22, I say as a joke, <laughs> but like that's old in TikTok when the average user age is 14. <sighs> so it was something that I started it off making jokes. Like it was a very, a lot of like feminist jokes, kind of Twitter-esque mm -hmm. content. It really was something that was supposed to be just satirical. I'm not in any way like a stand-up comedian but it was fun I think that there's like a certain flavor and beauty mm -hmm. to sarcasm online and I had a lot of fun with that and that's what it was and then obviously the interconnectedness of the fact that I'm an Asian woman the fact that I go to Harvard the fact that I'm outspoken um you know tempted people in comments to bring up mm -hmm. more serious like racial mm -hmm. gendered offensive comments that really directed me into the internet like, had a problem with a woman that's crazy i don't believe you at all that's there's no yeah. way that was your experience asian woman like people are <laughs> so used to that like that's the narrative that we embody mm -hmm. in the world yeah it's yeah. No, that's so, um, yeah, that's very insightful for you to pick up on that because I feel like only in the last few years have I really um, been able to even like publicly talk about that. Be and I, as part of this is just working in, uh, I don't know, I'm, there's a reckoning now, but, and I'm very grateful for, I'm already doing this like weird uh, PR thing, but I'm very grateful for all the opportunities I've had, but there's definitely, I would say like 10 years ago was kind of thing where there was a cool girl sort of motif where it was cool to not complain even when everyone knew something was fucked up and I think that applied to being an Asian woman online too because it was almost like fun to just make fun of like over sexualized Asian girls to be like I get why you guys don't like them I'm not like that instead of going wait why do we do that that's kind of a fucked up Thing, you know we're making fun of women who get sex sex trafficked as like a punchline in like movies and it's like huh that might be kind of weird <laughs> something that like I realized but it wasn't really until this all came together in the past two weeks really that I was like holy I don't know if I can swear holy yeah, you can God. <laughs> like I fully didn't realize how the power structures of like patriarchy, white supremacy, heteronormativity, nationalism, what they do is they set social norms of acceptability, mm -hmm. right? So like they create premises of likability, which for so long has been the easygoing, chill, quiet, shrunken girl, but mm -hmm. we don't realize that. Like we don't realize that we embody that when we say like, oh, like I'm gonna like eat a hot dog when I'm around my guy friends because <laughs> like I don't care about diet culture. Or, you know, like she's like a little crazy. Like that mm -hmm. girl's crazy, but I'm not like her. You know, and that takes time to unlearn because these systems of power, what they do is they modify the norms. And so anyone who speaks out against that or anyone who dares defy that, whether it be intentionally or not, mm -hmm. their very existence threatens that supremacy and that power structure. So when you have, you know, outspoken, demanding Asian women who are simultaneously hypersexualized and desexualized in all mm -hmm. of media and society, like we're someone that should be submissive, but we're also non-threatening at the same time. Yeah. You know, but we're also like never going to be beautiful enough for a man to want to marry, but mm -hmm. we're always going to be like sexy enough for them to want to have sex with, you know, and it's like all of these double standards and like incongruencies that we never acknowledge because we try to fit into like white culture and mm -hmm. male culture. That is one of those things that like I haven't really had the time to deconstruct until recently when I'm like, holy crap 
all these people that are, you know, doxers or intimidators, mm -hmm. what they do is they like tell girls to shut up. They say, I'm going to kill you. They say, I'm going to mm -hmm. rape you. They say, what the heck are you doing in the spotlight? And it feeds into this broader concept of white supremacy and masculine supremacy or patriarchy maintaining itself by shutting up anyone who speaks out through these like very normal structures of like, well, she's crazy. She's mm -hmm. dangerous. She's hysterical. She's, you know, just all of these things that we see and we're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Like a crying woman is like emotionally irrational when reason and emotion don't have to be mutually exclusive, but we've created it as such. And then we automatically pin this like hysterical emotion onto women. Yeah. Like their anger is never valid. Well, I, I, I mean, it's funny because I think hysteria used to be something a long time ago they used to diagnose women with, but like they would say, uh, I mean, it was also not in all cases, but it was a euphemism also for a woman who like weren't getting satisfied in bed, which is so funny it's for a man to literally blame a woman for not making her come. Be like, wow, you're so hysterical. Um, I can't satisfy you, but I guess you need to go to the doctor because you're so crazy because I'm so bad in bed. That's literally, I mean, oh, I sorry, mean, you cut off there. By the mistreatment mm -hmm. and the immense like dogmatizing and like sexism towards women, like all of it, you know, like not taking accountability and then gaslighting or tone policing or emotion policing yeah how or how people in general who are not the small little box of submission mm -hmm. exist in the world you know and i think that like jillian flynn brought that out with gone girl it was the first time that the chill girl trope was finally exposed for being so that like the megan fox and you know the you know, Rachel McAdams of the world were like, oh, you know, they really limit the capacity for not like them in themselves, but the characters that are built for them and constructed are constructed by men yeah. for men. You know? And I think that that's something that we've seen really like being deconstructed in terms of like slut shaming, right? Like that's something that in the last decade, we've seen really a lot of pushback against it because it's like you're shaming women in an attempt to minimize them. to control and them yeah well um uh i like that you brought up gone girl because it's fun. like even that move even the book was then made into a movie and then fincher directed and he's such a like i mean he's a great director but he's an example of like that sort of like hyper masculinity yeah i feel like you're so eloquent for and you put it all in this way that like i have only just realized in the last few years um I just want to sort of wrap up this intro by pointing out. So the, the TikTok I mentioned where you have a conversation with yourself about platonic guy friends, you do this, you illustrate the critical thinking you say, um, cause they're both played by you and you say, so every guy uh, that's sexually attracted to you is entitled to have sex with you. And then the other you is like, well, no, it's okay to wonder if someone's attracted to you, but it's another to be worried that they're going to make a move on you. And I like how you say that because it's, it's not about like, you know, writing a think piece or medium essay, which we can still do, but sometimes it's just about having a normal casual conversation, not trying to like own the libs or, you know, you know, prove someone wrong. It's literally just trying to understand why you believe something and then get to the truth because that is true. It's when you say you can be friends with guys or it's true for some people. And I would say I relate to that. It might not be true for everyone, but it's not the argument that you can be friends with guys isn't that they d all don't want to have sex with you. It's just that that's a factor in every relationship possibly. But if you respect someone, you shouldn't have to worry that one day they're going to get you drunk and then have sex with you. Like it's, it's two separate conversations and you, yeah, you kind of illustrate exactly. that really well. And I think that, you know, TikTok is a really remarkable platform for young people because it makes content digestible. Mm -hmm. You know, it makes, it makes it understandable in a minute. So even in the times and the videos where I'm being very articulate and intellectual, it's still digestible because it's under a minute, you know, versus like the conversations, which are very much, oh, I could actually see how someone would push back on what you're saying, you know, um, which is what I do in a lot of, or in some of my conversational videos with myself, you know, it's not like because I think that I'm another person having a, mm -hmm. you know, bipolar conversation. It's solely because a lot of the times we mistake you know, our intention of like, oh, like, but it's okay to wonder if a guy is going to want to have sex with us and then push back on that, you know, like mm -hmm. push back on maybe that voice in our head that's saying, well, should I 
be concerned that a guy wants to have sex with me or like should I be worried and should I be mm-hmm. scared type of thing which is like ultimately what I think TikTok does really well for its audience which is why one it's so young but also two it's like growing in terms of its social activism and social justice well there's nuance which I actually think this ties really well to the story because when Jack posted your t- and it's funny because I did see it later in the news but or uh, but I first saw it when I was um I don't, actually don't remember if I told you this, but I, I made a stealth account. I think I hinted at this, but I made a stealth account because um, I've been researching like Trump bots, which I've kind of talked about in this pod, but it's basically like a fake conservative account. I won't tell you guys what it is to don't blow my cover, <laughs> but I follow a lot of um, the bots as well as some of the conservative sort of like radio hosts and like instigators. And he's one of them. And I saw him post your video and the caption was something like, oh, now liberals are having conversations with themselves. And I remember like, I feel like I've maybe seen it on my for you page or something before. So I was like, oh, okay, cool. Like it's just a TikTok video. And then a few days later, it became this whole thing. And it's so funny that he thought that was an insult because you're literally (laughs) exercising a very evolved form of critical thinking of like dissecting your own beliefs to understand why, which is so like there's such a gaping scarcity of that on the right not everyone but a lot of them aren't willing to look at themselves so I found that was really interesting that he thought that was an insult when you were actually using this as a way to understand your own beliefs better yeah it's also just like the critical thinking involved in in terms of my entire experience one to understand an analogy later but two to to understand like the immense hypocrisy Mm -hmm. in like retaliatory harassment, you know, is something that involves critical thinking that if people don't understand that it's an app where like you record yourself talking, that you're not going to like put somebody else there necessarily to like script them into it. Um, I just thought was definitely quite funny. I didn't take the tweet seriously when I first read it, you know, Mm -hmm. because I was like, you're insulting the fact that I'm having a conversation with myself. Like, when it's like clearly for a skit, you know, yeah. but. Um, well, that brings me to our main story. Um, Clara, is there anything you would like to tell me? Yeah. So <laughs> last week I was a trending hashtag. My name, hashtag Clara Janover is trending. I was doxxed. I was subsequently sent hundreds of thousands of harassing emails, comments, etc., all because of a viral TikTok of mine that was shared across a lot of prominent conservative Twitter accounts. That's so wild. And you, it, specifically, it was you were speaking out or you were um, trying to uh, like illustrate the flaws in the right wing argument against Black Lives Matter. So it was more than just um, like a joke or hate speech or anything like that. They tried to make it feel like you were hating them where um, and you guys, I'm sure if you look it up, you can see it. Or maybe we can link to it. But you were trying to have a nuanced conversation about why the logic was flawed on the other side. Yeah, I mean, there's, firstly, it was clearly to show and like depict the hypocrisy of all lives matter in response. It's it's all the people who say all lives matter in response to black lives matter who would never go to a funeral for somebody else and say, mm-hmm. well, like my family's gonna die too, who would never go to a cancer fundraiser and say all diseases matter, who would never look at the 4th of July and say all countries or all holidays matter. You know, it's a way to detract and derail attention to Mm -hmm. make themselves feel included or to push their anti-Black motive, you Mm -hmm. know, whatever it be, obviously. And I address this in the original viral video of mine that was tweeted by Jack, but just because you're less racist than like neo-Nazi clan members, it doesn't mean that you're not racist. Mm -hmm. And saying (laughs) all lives matter, you know, it just completely overlooks the sentiment of a pro-black movement. And they interpret it as anti-white because every anti-white movement in history has been inherently Mm anti-black, you know, and that's something that doesn't exist with Black Lives Matter, but it is seeking to dismantle the white supremacy and the systematic and systemic injustices facing specifically black Americans, you know, in a way that the all lives matter rhetoric and mentality has always infuriated me. You know, this idea that like, you can't have gay pride without saying, well, we need to have all marriage pride. (laughs) You know, it just, it doesn't really exist in other 
aspects of conversation and movement. Yeah. And so I was pointing out, you know, in if you see somebody bleeding from a stab wound or just bleeding in general from like any injury, you don't ignore that and then point to your like minimal paper cut or like non-existent mm-hmm. injury and say all injuries or all cuts matter, you know? Mm-hmm. And that was what the video was so clearly depicting. So what, okay, I, I definitely have a couple of things I want to um, <laughs> ask about that because I, I used, I feel like I used to get lost in this logic hole with them as well because I'd be like, if only they could see. And now, I don't know if this is right, but now I have a n- new theory that they do know and they're trying to um, obfuscate and confuse you w- and make you frustrated and exhaust you because I it's like, it's like they do see that you're bleeding and they're like, oh, paper cuts hurt and they they do know. That's kind of how I feel now. I don't think everyone, but I think a lot of the instigators know what you're trying to say and get it and just don't care. Um, and then so we try to, on the left, like empathize and make them understand. Whereas they're like, oh no, I understand. I'm just going to pretend not to. I don't yeah, know if I you agree with yeah, that, I but I both. feel like seeing this lately, like everything on such a big stage where our, our literal, you know, president is um, <laughs> saying very racist things makes me go, I think think he knows he's racist <laughs> but I don't know we want to I mean, hope I mean I think the reality is is and I I wrote about this I published an article but you know in a lot of ways I think a lot of people sort of reluctantly or like begrudgingly understand that it wasn't serious and I'm not like a threat to society that I'm not you know someone who's going to actually be a violent terrorist in the world but I think whether they inherently or like subconsciously or very intentionally realize it, you know, like I will always be this like convenient four way intersection. Mm. Right. So like their disposition and like distaste to see the black lives matter movement as inherently violent and extremist, Mm. you know, their desire to seek revenge for cancel culture because they're mad that all these white boys Mm. have been canceled or like, you know, whatever. And then their distaste for liberal elites because I go to Harvard and they hate that I've been, you know, Mm -hmm. indoctrinated into liberal elitism. And then their their simultaneous hatred and hypersexualization of women and Asians, which Mm -hmm. was clear with the feedback and the harassment and the comments that I got weren't just like, you're a danger to society or like all lives matter or you, you know, you shouldn't have said this, like that was irresponsible. It also was like, I'm going to come into your house and rape you or like Uh Ching Chong, shut the fuck up and go back to your coronavirus infused Uh. country. Or like, just like these things that intertwined my identities that were like tokenizing and vilifying all of them, you know, but at the same time, I was like undeserving of every single one of them. Like I didn't deserve to get into Harvard. I like didn't deserve to be like the ideal Chinese figure because I was outspoken. All these things that were like Mm -hmm. so complex societally or like in society's depiction of me, like a young Chinese Harvard educated, outspoken liberal individual, like who uses activism to her platform. You didn't serve their narrative. And it's sort of one of those things where like, again, what happened to me wasn't necessarily just in relation to my original TikTok like that for a lot of people right mm-hmm. for thousands of people it's like oh my god she's a danger you threaten to stab people like what the heck you're dangerous you're a crazy lunatic and there were a lot of people who are like okay like even if it is an analogy like this girl is stupid and this girl like needs to be condemned from society and removed like right how can you be reason- both stupid and also a danger like how can you be a criminal mastermind trying to you know, kill all lives matter movement and also a dumb bitch. I mean, you're not, but I'm just saying like using their, like that, that doesn't even make sense. So then you're a dumb bitch who didn't deserve to get in Harvard, but also you've got all these skills to trick everyone. Exactly. (laughs) So I was simultaneously like completely discredited. I mean, I can talk Mm -hmm. about this later, but I was completely like, no, talk about it. Yeah. So what what, what exactly happened? Because you say you got docs. I know that generally means, um, you know, people show your identity and where you live and all that. How did you, um, I guess, t- take me through from your point of view, how you found out about this and like w- sort of the ramp up. I imagine it happened quickly, but how did you figure, yeah, out, figure it the out? The majority happened within three days. So like from June 30th to July 2nd or 3rd was like when all of this sort of went down. And I didn't know what doxing was, but I kept on getting these like very concerned and like 
helpful messages being like, here's tips for what to do when you're being doxxed. Oh my God. And that seems to be like so many people's tips to me were like, they were worried that I was doxxed. And for me, that was like, well, I don't have a legal permanent residential address. I don't have any living parents. I'm on my own. And like, there's very little information about me on the internet because again, like I'm not a very prominent person internet wise. So for me, that wasn't like, it was stupid, I think is the easiest way for me to interpret it. Like the first day when this was happening, I was just like, these people are just actually insane. And then it got, it got to a point, the disheartening and quite like terrifying part was when the media became involved in like the news landscape because it's completely uncontrolled and unregulated and mm-hmm. out of your control. And so the next day, the next three days, and it was predominantly by like the New York Post, Daily Mail, et cetera, Fox News, they were completely like within their power to publish these completely slanderous and like un, like untrue information about me containing like disinformation to the max, like publishing whatever they wanted to do, posting pictures of me crying and like, Mm-hmm. me like with like photoshopped pictures of like knives in my hand yeah. and it just spread it such a magnificently uncontrollable rate that I just it was so far beyond me like yeah. I was so far removed from like myself that I was just Harvard student Harvard grad Harvard educated Deloitte employee crying huh. TikTok Harvard undergrad you know, Asian girl, like that's so interesting that those are the terms they, I mean, it is all to serve their, again, to be, to serve their narrative. Cause right now there's a big uh, push, you know, led by Betsy DeVos and the whole, you know, like the uh, conservative side against liberal education because they think it's changing us. I don't think they really believe this, but that's what they're um, peddling. And so it's convenient to talk about how you went to Harvard, but in another situation, I mean, like, uh, okay, with like Brock Turner, and that's something because I'm from the Bay Area, and the woman was yeah. Asian, and she's come out talked about it since. When the story first came out, my parents um, they didn't know who she was, but like we have a feeling that she, based on the way like it kind of spe- they just had a hunch They're like we think she's an Asian girl, and then and she was, and they made it all about how he was a st- like prominent Stanford athlete. So it's like so convenient when it's like in that case they were trying to use that as a. Uh, reason for his potential and in this case they're trying to show yeah. like how far Harvard's fallen from like it's old you know yeah. all, all white all-star American days and it's just so interesting how even within their own rhetoric they contradict themselves well I mean it was something where so when these articles were published come tr- like attempting to discredit me and like frame me as a compulsive liar as like an undeserving bitch you know all these things like they simultaneously sought to like make me undeserving and like incompetent in terms of like my capability to reach like Harvard student, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But then I also embodied Harvard student. And Mm -hmm. it's something that like all of these things, like all of these contradictions go unnoticed because again, the goal isn't to like be consistent or like confront the unwillingness or uncomfortable idea that you're destroying, not like destroying, but you're, harassing and terrifying a 22 year old girl with no history of you know the spotlight and you know they don't want to come to that realization so it was was all of one of these things where it's like people don't reflect like the same Mm -hmm. people in my dms and messages saying like i'm gonna stab you or like come here so i can sodomize and gang rape you like those people aren't reflecting if they can't realize the harm in those messages they're not going to realize like oh, you know, like I'm being willfully ignorant by like simultaneously mm-hmm. discrediting this girl and making her accountable for everything she is identity yeah, wise, you wow. know? That's a good way to put it. Yeah, they're literally saying the same thing to you that they're accusing you of. But I'm, yeah, so how did you, so you got a message like from your friends first and then you realized, so were you getting, I guess before this went viral, you were already on TikTok. Um, how, like, were you already, uh, uh, I guess just so people know, like how, how, were you seeing trolls like coming in and you were noticing them or were you already like big and talking about stuff like this and you're just used to ignoring them? I mean, like at what sort of point did you realize this is different than, you know, the average trolls on TikTok? So I like, it's something where prior to this I had, I mean, I had, I've only had TikTok a couple of months. I started it in like late March or April or something like that. Mm -hmm. And until really, mid to late 
May, I think I only had like 20,000 followers. So mm-hmm. It wasn't really like a gravity that was overwhelming. I also still don't and like haven't taken it to heart when they're like really racist and like Mm -hmm. hateful people. I think I noticed there was a difference when, you know, when I started making more Black Lives Matter content, like my following jumped to like 80 to 90,000. And then when I saw this tweet by Jack Posobiec, it was something that like Twitter had never been uh, the social media of my choice. Like I've never Mm -hmm. been, I think I had maybe 200 (laughs) followers before this. And then when it started growing, I was like, oh, these are trolls. Uh Ha ha. I didn't, I even like, if anyone goes back onto my TikTok and watches the progression of me, Mm. like documenting this, it begins with like, this is so funny. Like, this is really funny to like, oh, it's, oh, it's kind of like accelerated. Now they're taking videos of me stabbing and like reporting me to like the Department of Homeland Security to like, oh, they reported you to the Department of Homeland Security. Yeah. FBI. Were you contacted by any of them? No, no. I mean, obviously not. Like, no one, like, my friend's dad who works in the FBI, like, called me and he was like, don't worry. Like, this is so far not of interest of the FBI. (sighs) Like, no one cares about this. They're even disproving their own. I mean, like, not to open, like, we really don't have to go down this path. But this, the the defund police, um, because I've gotten trolls on TikTok and Twitter for talking about it. And I usually do it through a joke lens where I'm like, hey, actually go read up on it. Here's my joke take on it. That's still real. But yeah. when people go like, oh, who are you going to call? So it's like, those are the people who say, who are you going to call? And then they call and they don't do anything. So it's like either you <laughs> just did it to troll, which they probably did, or or the fake version, which, they, which they're which they saying is true, is them um, really feeling scared, which I don't believe. And so they needed a call. And in that reality, the police also did nothing. So it's like either way, you are like in two realities that – don't work out for you like they neither yeah. of those make you look good because if you're arguing that the police are there to keep you safe and they did nothing well and you felt unsafe then i feel like you just disproved your own argument but if you really yeah. just did this to troll then you just showed why the system favors you and yeah did you know jack uh how do you say his name Pasi- i really yeah i think it's Pasi- i think it's Pasabia. Pasabia. that's how but I pronounced it in my videos, Jack Posobiec. I don't know how it's pronounced. Did you I know him or were you aware of him at all? No, I, again, like, I don't ever pay attention mm-hmm. to like right wing loons. Like, I just don't, it's something that I don't follow <laughs> Trump on Twitter. I don't engage with that. I still to this point have not engaged in any way with like specific mm-hmm. people, you know, like I never flashed back at like Ann Coulter, Mm -hmm. you know, or all of these like very prominent, verified adult, Mm -hmm. either politicians or like, I don't, creators, you know, it was just something that like Charlie Kirk, Ali Struckley, like Mark Dice, um, James Woods, et cetera, like all these verified people with like a conglomerate of almost 10 million followers were tweeting at me or like about me. And I never like engaged with that. You know, it wasn't something that was like, would do me any service. And so I think that that's something that helped in terms of handling all of this. I mm-hmm. think going back to like my, the progression videos on my TikTok, um, it was like, it just got progressively more serious. And then I realized that it was something that was like beyond experience by like an hour after Jack's tweet, because mm. that's when the stabbing video of mine, like this, it, it happened because this one guy I don't know his name, Um, but he quite literally responded to every single tweet that I was mentioned in, in either support or criticism with like, this girl is a dangerous like threat to society. Um, And because of it, it just again, like spread because he was doing that at on like very famous people's Hmm. tweets. And then it just gained momentum. And like, it was that one person um, again, who really bolstered this but it wasn't like just this one person yeah it's Um, well there's kind of this um so i don't know how much you know about these bots and i'm i'm probably not even um as well versed as i should be but there's like they charlie kirk is one of these guys who actually hosts um like seminars teaching young right-wing like extremists how to meme like they literally will host these seminars and teach them how to like own the libs like that's a thing so they actually spend they, like turning point usa i think is the name of one of his groups spent like eight million dollars last year on workshops like this so yeah. and that's been documented in the news and obviously everything in the news grain of salt but 
the fact is that it's what you're noticing is not is the very direct result of that but it's not a coincidence like people doing it so fast knowing exactly how to you know go back in your you know um old history find exactly the video that's going to get the most emotional response edit it really quickly and everyone's like ready to go that has been trained and i'm sure they've tried to do that with multiple people maybe to different degrees of success and yours really took off but i i don't think you're i think you're onto something when you say like that the speed and just like rigor and just like how nasty it was it's not just people being upset at you it's people like yeah. offensively targeting you. I was a scapegoat you. in a lot yes. of ways for the hatred of all these things that people may not have even realized, but were mm-hmm. so very obvious. I mean, online harassment is so easy and unfathomably public because users can act anonymously. You have these bots. There are millions of people watching on a regular basis. The speed at which you can do it is unprecedented, but also the network effects of social media dissociate public figures or like accounts Mm -hmm. from their true character. You know, like the number of people who actually would have had this like anger and dis or like hatred towards me still probably big, but like not as prominent and not as fast, not as expedited. So it allows, you know, cruelty to be amplified and spread an unprecedented scale. And what, what it does is it like all of the all of the comments and all of the messages just really, really embody this whole like mm-hmm. white supremacy maintains itself by instigating fear mm-hmm. in the hearts of people who question both its violent authority yeah. and you know how it operates. But then it does so at a rate that is so out of control of the victim mm-hmm. that you the victim is either forced to ignore it. Mm. or continue to chase an unachievable Mm -hmm. standard of either perfection or of like correcting the truth, you know? And it's something that like, again, when this all started, I remember being, being like, I, I want my truth to get out there. I, I want to prove my innocence. I want to, you know, defraud the disinformation that has been spread around me. But the reality is, is like, disinformation and misinformation is going to be read and Mm -hmm. like believed by those who want to believe it. And I can't undo the damage to the public perception of my sincerity, even if I were to present every single thing out there, which I've done, you know, like these people don't want to hear it. They'll always find another reason to hate either me or what I stand for or Mm -hmm. what I embody via my identity. Well, it's their outrage often is built on a lie and I'll say this happens on the left too so I'm not just saying this on the to the right but there's just more like we can post so many holes in the very first tweet to begin with which makes it harder to have discourse because you can reveal all these truths and if someone's willing to use lies to argue all they have to do is just like come up with a lie so yeah. it totally negates the whole idea of discourse I mean yeah for an even dumber metaphor I guess it'd be like if I was like you know I don't know if I was trying to help my friend move or something and I was just trying to ask them like hey where should we put this lamp and then she kept saying and I was holding a lamp and then she was just like that's not a lamp that's a couch and then all of a sudden I'm like okay where should I put it and she's like no no that's a couch and then you're not arguing about yeah and then you're like again I don't understand this is so obviously a lamp do we need to are you okay it's like are you okay do you what do you think is a couch and then all of a sudden you're just like well I just want to put it down so okay it's a couch where should I put it and now you're crying and they're just like oh over there and you're like the fuck was that I feel like that's how they argue is they try to like get to these things like emotional breaking points and then make you feel so bad that you're just like whatever it's obviously fake just go with what they say and then they yeah I mean it's emotional manipulation and it's gaslighting you know it's the equivalent of just like disregarding and like emotion policing Mm -hmm. someone in a way that like maybe implicit and maybe like really subconscious you know I think a lot of these people don't think that they're being as sexist and racist as they are you know but it's something that's conditioned and embodied and unavoidable when you're in the spotlight as someone who will never be disassociated with everything that people want to hate, you know? Um, It's interesting you talked about the, um, the Asian being an Asian woman too, because that's something I didn't dissect that much until the recent years. But in 2016, I I used to work at this site called cracked and it's like a comedy news site. But um, after the election, I wrote an article about how it, like my feed was really split where a lot of my white, more privileged friends were just like, it's okay, calm down, which I get that they were reacting to stuff they didn't feel. So they almost felt like they were trying to play the, 
don't worry. And then another half of my feed was freaking out. So I, the tone of it was more like, stop telling us to calm down. It's just, we have two different realities and they could yeah. both exist, but realize some people are freaking out for real reasons. And I got like, I didn't get docs, but I got like a couple creepy trolls the next day. Like someone called my phone and, but nothing like dangerous. But one, the, one of the first comments um, I got was someone went back in like months ago. It was like, maybe over a year before that I had gone to Europe and they posted a bunch of like trolley comments on my Europe photos and were calling me like really racist things and also criticizing me of like trying to appropriate European culture. And so when you said the thing about the Asian identity, that really stuck with me because on top of them not liking what you're saying, they're also mad that you are trying to fit into like the white world which they created yeah. like they made it so you can't succeed unless you fit into their world and then they're mad that you're succeeding in their world yeah well so this is i mean i don't have to open this can of worms but this is called the asymmetrical entrance into power right so we see this in terms of like i, I have to try to break it down in terms of like well you see that women are successful when they enter male dominated fields like when you see them being ceos when you see them mm -hmm. going into stem that's congratulated that's applauded that is oh you've made it like you're redefining your empowerment by entering these male oriented landscapes. Mm -hmm. But we don't see that like the trajectory of feminism or femininity changing mm -hmm. because there's not that same empowerment when men become nurses or when men become psychologists or when men become caregivers. Mm -hmm. Like you see that women, when they transition into masculinity are celebrated and applauded, but we don't see that femininity yeah. is applauded. You know, and yeah. it's something that those are two very distinctive terms that like I didn't realize until I took like a feminist theory course in college. And then when you see that in race, like so mm -hmm. I grew up and I will never claim to have grown up culturally Asian. I grew up with my white mother, mm -hmm. you know, and I grew up with no Chinese influence other than like my mm -hmm. classmates. And even then I didn't have a very Asian filled community growing up in New Haven. And so it was something that like, I became very Americanized and whitened very naturally. Mm -hmm. And I resented a lot of my Asian-ness until going to college, until mm -hmm. having Asian friends, until realizing like there's so much power and beauty in being Asian American. When in reality, all of my childhood and adolescence and teenage years, I was mortified of being Chinese because I thought that it made me less likable mm -hmm. because it does it like it makes people less willing to engage or mm -hmm. give you that like opportunity to be a person because you're going to be the Asian and so then when you then enter that whiteness then it's like oh she's either too white mm -hmm. and like that's you know whatever or it's like she's not white enough like you can never meet this impossible standard of perfection and it goes back to the inconsistencies of what they want from women. Like you have to be skinny, but like you can't be too skinny. And like, you have to be opinionated and like you have to, or you have to be like smart, but like not smarter than the man that you're with, you know? And yeah. it goes back to this whole, like shrinking yourself into an unachievable, perfect image that they like say is possible. They say it's like possible to be mm -hmm. like the, and then they name these like perfect women mm -hmm. that are still criticized. And yes. they say that it's possible in order to like, keep that possibility of that like American dream up there knowing that they're going to step on you and pull you back with chains every step of the way to get there. You know, that's yeah. like an unavoidable truth. That's yeah. That's such a w good way to put it. I mean, when you earlier were talking about um, how women get shown crying for having emotion, I, I, I thought of that because when you just said this, I thought like when men, when they cry, it's celebrated as like showing sensitivity or you know it's almost like when men are able to show weakness like it's it's so applauded because it's so out of the norm whereas when women show weakness it's um criticized and when they show strength it's also criticized so you're like yeah. wait a minute hold on this doesn't yeah. feel like it's adding up they can't both be negative um it's almost like they just don't like women but that's a crazy yeah. thought um yeah, it's sort of like men will let all they have to do is not leave their child and their like yeah. dad of the year, you know, and it's it goes back to so like I posted two videos of me crying after I was let go from my job because it was very Oh, yeah, we like, didn't I, even talk about that. So you what so what happened with that? Because I know that um, you were supposed to work at Deloitte and then people contact your employer. So how, how did that play out for you? Yeah. Like, so the impact of doxing, what it did, the, the thing is that when it hit like the news media and when it hit the rate and scale that it did, people found like my LinkedIn, not like found, it was public 
publicly out there, but they started sharing that. So like pictures of my LinkedIn got like tens of thousands of, of retweets. Wow. And because of it, there were like a lot of people contacting Deloitte. And it's something that like I contacted Deloitte the day that, th- that this originally had happened with Jack's tweet asking to like speak to them and like providing them with like links and timeline and date stamps mm-hmm. saying like, is there any way that we can speak to this? And then I got a text or I got like an email from them the next day at like 4.45 that was just like hop on a call right now. Wow. I hopped on a call and then in like two minutes they were just like, we have to let you go uh, because of like the pressures and like, you know, we can't condone any semblance of violence. And then I was like, I asked very truthfully, like, is there any way that I can speak to my experience and like explain what's happening and they said like our decision is final like we don't want to waste any more of your time which was just like a bullshit way of covering their asses and saving Mm -hmm. face in the conversation and so I I did I cried because in again having grown up in poverty having grown up in a very low socioeconomic status having lost my mother and being completely financially independent from the age of 16 onward like the promise of corporate america wasn't like oh i'm so passionate about consulting it was like Mm -hmm. i'm passionate about working my ass off to be stable and to be you know vocationally secure for the next you Mm -hmm. know however long i'm working there and so then i i did cry because it was like whoa i had stability and now i don't in a way that feels a lot more magnified when you're like orphaned and, you know, technically Mm. and legally homeless, even though I wasn't actually ever homeless. Um, And then in both of my videos crying, the ending message on both of them were very, I think, and stand that they were very empowering and very powerful. Like, you can fire me and I'm sorry that you can't see that I'm on the right side of history, Mm -hmm. but like, I'm not shutting up. But again, no matter how resilient the message that I said was, like, those who choose to see weakness fed by like the internalized sexist dogma centered about like white fragility and like masculinity. It's like their physiological unwillingness or discomfort seeing a woman crying and labeling Uh her as like crazy and emotional and like, uh, like irrational makes it so that there's this message that like, you can't like, as a woman, you can't cry and fight at the same time, which Mm -hmm. isn't true. Yeah, I feel like I fight really well. Like you want to avoid a woman with a knife while she's crying. I mean, like, really? Yeah. (laughs) Like the exclusive definition of strength doesn't exist (laughs) solely via masculinity and emotional Mm -hmm. repression, even though that's what we like tell people. But then when we're angry, Mm. then like we also aren't like, like we can't be angry and fight at the same time. There's no emotion. Yeah. So the only the only way to appease supremacy is by shutting up, you know, but like we don't they don't realize that. It's like almost it kind of goes into thematically your videos of c- having conversations with yourself because I I've, I've, I hope people listen to this and, and it resonates with them. But you talking about trying to fit this like um, narrative and this perfect image really resonated with me because I feel like my early 20s was a lot like that. And uh, even my childhood just trying to fit into yeah. figure out first what people like and then be the thing they like instead of figuring out what I like and then being the thing I liked, which sounds so stupid. And yes, we hear it all the time in Disney movies, but I didn't really know what that meant, right? Because you have yeah. to first, you first see people succeeding by being what people like. And then you realize, mm-hmm. oh, they're not actually They just like some of the, you know, popular blonde girls at my school were just the thing people liked. And so no matter how hard I try, I won't be that. And I could just like myself. And then hopefully the, you know, in time, the sands of time will change and people will like that, too. But I think that's that's something that I couldn't have really understood till I learned it through experience. But being yourself, as stupid as that sounds like figuring out oh I am myself you know whether I went to Harvard or I didn't or whatever it doesn't it's none of these are the things it's it's important because it's true to you like it makes you you and if that wasn't you then it wouldn't feel empowering to have achieved that milestone because it's not what you want you know yeah and I mean I think this speaks so broadly to like the amount of commentary on like opinionated women's posts and like messages and comments that I get are like you're never going to find a boyfriend like this or like people aren't <laughs> going to like you which stems back to this likability but so also that he can protect again, you like, like why would you want it is, I know it's like what is <laughs> it is scary to think about yeah. being undesirable mm. but then you know and that's something that even I grapple with is like this idea of I mean I can't help but think the number of guys who are going to want to interact with me. And again, this is like not empowering whatsoever, but like a vulnerable truth. Mm. Like the number of people who are going to want to be friends with me or guys who are going to want to be romantically invested in me lowers when you're not this likable ball of like blonde, blue eyed, 
you know, cuteness and sweetness, Mm -hmm. you know, and like, like that's simultaneously a good thing because then it, it weeds out a lot of people that you don't want in your life, Mm -hmm. but it also at times can make you feel very lonely. Like you're fighting for a bigger picture, but you're also doing that by like making yourself into an abstract of power Mm -hmm. that again is like tiring. And I, I can't not, you know, talk or like speak to the insecurity that's arisen from this that like, Obviously, it's it's wonderful knowing the amount of support I'm going to and will always get. But it's also this, you know, real truth that, mm-hmm. again, it intimidates people from speaking out. Like a lot of people, not us, but like a lot of people don't speak out because right. they don't want to lose that essence of likability, especially the ones that are already vulnerable to prejudice, you know, like women of color, mm-hmm. et cetera, like don't want to push the envelope, like because they're their existence pushes the envelope. Their yeah, existence exactly. makes guys not want to approach them. Like approachability yeah. and likability is a terrifying thing to like not think about having, which yeah. is awful to say, but it's a reality. And I understand how that's something that, like I read these messages of like, no guy's ever going to want to be with an angry, opinionated pol- politician. And it's like, that's something that, you know, takes a lot of unlearning mm. a critically flawed society but it's still very much true like there's truth to that statement it's just a horrible reality that we live in. it's it's how they see your value and it it does still hurt i think you're speaking to a very important part that gets lost in the discussion on the left about cancel culture is like it's okay to also acknowledge that this is hard and there's pain involved it like you have to acknowledge the good and the bad but it doesn't mean it's wrong right like i think about i used to argue with women who um were like i just want to be a housewife i don't want to work and it's not and i used to be like well you're not liberated but now i feel like these like conversations i have with myself help because i'm like you know what that's them and this is me they don't want what i want and maybe they do feel like maybe I was for a while feeling challenged by them because I wasn't even sure if, you know, maybe I, that does sound nice and I I didn't want to be, you know, threatened by their image of perfection. Now I feel like if someone comes at me with that, it's a, it's a little easier for me to be like, okay, I see that you're angry and you probably haven't dealt with your trauma and that's okay. Like my existence isn't going to erase yours. And I'm also not mad that they want those things anymore. I'm like, if you want to be a housewife and that's you, you should do that. Like, I don't think that that challenges. um, I know that might be radical to say, but I don't think that sets us backwards. I think what sets us forward is realizing everyone's a person and not, um, yeah. And it's like like understanding that (laughs) women are people and not like an, an abstract concept. But we don't all right? want so, the same thing, you know? Like, And it's also like <laughs> feminism aims to give opportunity and choice to women. Like if you, that's why it's like pro-choice. Like if you, okay, that's another debate. We don't have to get right, into it. Right, right. But when people say like, like, oh, so no, I don't want to go to work. Yeah, if we like, have to make it's women work, like, it's like, well, what if we I, don't want yeah. to? Yeah, a lot of people criticize like Disney princesses because it's like, oh, like we don't need dainty princesses anymore. It's like, no, like we just need for there to be women existing beyond the dainty yeah. princess. Both. But it's yeah. not to criticize those who do enjoy playing with Barbies and doing mm-hmm. their makeup, right? Like I think that feminism never gives you answers as to what is like the appropriate feminine behavior. It's just trying to remove what yeah. is seen as appropriate for femininity. Right. And like, that's why I think feminism is such an important word and concept because it extends more than just beyond like what women can do. Right. It's sort of like what femininity can encompass without judgment. It's like, uh, well, that even that criticism of like, you're never going to find a man is implying that you get your value from someone else. Like they weren't tweeting at Jack, like, oh, you're never going to want to find a girlfriend or whatever, because he can stand by himself. His value is not increased or decreased by who's standing next to him. And neither is yours, but that's the image they're trying to paint in your head, right? So then you feel like, oh no, I'm losing my value. But in reality, like, shouldn't they be saying like, hey, you wouldn't want to date a guy who doesn't want to date an outspoken woman, right? So it sounds like yeah. you now know who you don't want to date. Like, it's like, they don't ask you what you want. It's always, oh, nobody wants to date you. It is tough to hear that because it's not, it's hurtful, but it's not actually the truth. But it is hurtful to hear that kind of thing, I think. So, yeah, and they know completely. that. I think they're trying to hurt. Um, yeah, I feel like you have such a strong grasp on, um, like just like emotional maturity. I feel like it's very impressive. Thank Um, you. Wait, so did you study psychology at Harvard or what is it that you're interested in doing? I studied government and psychology, um, separately. So like not, you know, overlapping. And I think, 
I think I do want to go potentially into social work. I, I do acknowledge like the emotional maturity that I have for my age is definitely like beyond my years, but I don't know. <laughs> like I, I don't want to be a professional activist. I think that's something that like mm-hmm. kind of is worrisome, just like the yeah. amount of anger involved in it, you yeah. know, like it seems so like how I feel now, I don't want to feel for the rest of my life, mm. but maybe that is something I'm going to do. You know, maybe I will start, you know, a conversation podcast with like really smart and un- like very ad- like articulate individuals to like both learn and educate. I don't know what I'm doing. Like, yeah. I don't know what I'm doing a week from tomorrow. Um, I don't think you I need love- to go. And- I think you, sh- the point hopefully that you take from this is that you have something to say and that you're good at it and you can express yourself. So I don't, I think you're right. Getting hold into activism, like I'm grateful for people who do, you know, do that. And it's a great, you know, nice selfless thing, but we also need people who have empathy and express themselves well in every field, including finance. I mean, in politics, especially, right? Like maybe we're not drawn to those fields because they're full of, you know, toxic behavior, but, it would actually help to have more empathetic people there. So I, I think that you'll, uh, yeah, I feel like you'll find that calmness for sure. <laughs> I mean, I'm only on my, just on my way to finding it. And I can tell that you're, you're very good at dissecting that sort of thing. So I think Thank that's you. a, that's a good way to go. Yeah. Um, okay. I want to be- wrap up this story and then play a quick game to end, but as the sort of like wrap up, I want to give you a chance to like say anything you want to stuff, like maybe to Jack or anyone in the story, it could be your supporters or someone who came for you or whatever, just like as if they're here in the room, like giving you a chance to like tell them whatever you want. Like uh, if, if you want to say anything to them or to yourself in the past, just like pick someone in your mind. If you don't want to say who it is, that's okay too, but just kind of. Yeah. I just, I think to all of these people, there's, there's such a scale of people who resent and like hate me online. And I think that it is absurd to think that a legitimate death threat existed between the gray area of satire. You know, I think like the semantically and intellectually negligible differences are not something that I'm ever going to focus on, but I think there's absolutely nothing that I can really say to make people recognize my humanity um, when they actively refuse to. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really, again, never want to direct my the point of my message and my person to people who are never going to listen mm-hmm. because of all of their prejudice, you know? And so just like the people who are threatening me or who publicly threatened to run over protesters with their car or to break into homes with defund the police, you know, like supporting a president that condones and encourages justifying the endless murders of black Americans and lynching of black leaders, et cetera. Like you can, they always will. And like, you always will justify your own violence and threat and harm. And so it's not a matter of my opinion. And I think people need to Mm -hmm. maybe one day realize that, that the delivery of my opinion isn't what displeased them. Mm -hmm. It was the opinion itself, you know, and they're not going to see that, but if they could, I would, I would literally just encourage them to think like, why is it that I, why is it that I, when I saw it, I was taken aback and like, so offended, Mm -hmm. you know, in a way that's more than just maybe a literal interpretation of a video. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. So everyone should be looking at themselves when they're angry and not pointing fingers um that kind of leads into the final game I have it's based on your talking to yourself uh TikToks so I really really like this because this is a thing that um I've I've been doing more and I've talked about in the pod but I I kind of like will self-parent and self-soothe um just as a way to calm myself down when I have panic attacks by talking to myself and it really works because you know if we're as adults have the tools to help someone else we have the tools to help ourselves um, so this is called talking to myself with you, um, AKA me, myself, and I can't. So it's inspired by your TikToks. Basically I, uh, I'm going to give you a couple of things that I have thought in the last week. Cause I tend to, and I think maybe common things people think, um, they're negative things. Okay. So they're not meant to be, uh, I'm not saying them to get sympathy, but they're just things that people often think about themselves and then see if you can, um, have a conversation starting there and like talk yourself, talk to yourself the way you would. I'll put a timer on it. So we just, when it rings, we'll just move to the next one. So let's see. 
Um, okay. Does this make sense? So basically, yeah, for I'll give you an example. Okay. So if, okay. I, if I'm like, I don't feel pretty today, which is something a lot of people might think. And I would be like, I don't feel pretty today. Well, you look the same as you did yesterday. So maybe gotcha. you could put gotcha. some more makeup okay. on, but that might make you feel better. But do you think there's something else that is on your mind? And also, and then you kind Basically of, speaking to anxiety. Okay. Yeah, yes. I get it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Got it. Okay. All right. So we'll do a, let's see, we'll do a timer for 45 seconds. I feel like that's a good conversation. Okay. So here's the first one. Um, let's go with, okay. Uh, I shouldn't apply for this job because I won't get it apply for this job because I won't get it. Well, if that's your mentality going into every aspect of life and you apply this universally, you won't apply or do anything out of your comfort zone. And that's the mentality you had when applying to colleges. And, and look, you got into a completely random dream opportunity school for you. So I think you may only have this one chance to apply to this job or to this college and you may as well do it. You have nothing to lose other than rejection. That's good. Okay. I realize I set this on 45 minutes anyway. So that was about 30 seconds. I think 30 is good. Okay. I feel like I need to like record these and play them to myself. Okay. These are good pep talks. All right. Um, I want to drain my bank account and move to an island. Real things I have thought. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a real thing that I've thought too. I think, think about those who your presence in life have an impact on you know, proximally more than just yourself, obviously think about yourself and why you might be tempted to leave and escape. And if maybe that is the best thing for you, think about more appropriate and less dramatic ways you can do it or ways that you can do it within the continental U S. But even if you don't, you know, think, think clearly about okay. why you might want that. That was good. All right. Here's the final one. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> clearly I'm bad at technology. Um, okay. I think there's a ghost in my room. There's not a ghost in your room. Um, yeah, I, I don't have a great one for this other than whatever you think right now, think about what you would be interpreting if someone else said this to you. If someone said there was a ghost in their room, would you believe them or would you just tell them to breathe deeply and think good thoughts and, and realize that their anxiety is getting the better of them? That's so good. I mean, you literally turned the advice on the, that was a very inception advice where you're like, <laughs> think about what you would say while you're talking to yourself to someone else. I'm like, that's good advice. Yeah, that's uh, how I alleviate my anxiety. It's like, well, if someone came to you with this, what would you do? How would you comfort them? Yeah. And then give yourself that that kindness that we often forget to give to ourselves and we're really hard on our anxiety. It really works because I feel like a lot of, especially like comedians, because a lot of us will talk openly about stuff like this, but then at the same time, when we're in panic, can't deal with it on our own. And almost like as a way to try to get better, I'll help other people. And I'll realize like, it's not making me better because I'm compartmentalizing helping someone else versus myself. And mm -hmm. it doesn't connect until I start treating myself like a person, like what you were talking about, like people who don't see women as people or Asian women as people. It's like, well, I got to start seeing myself as a person, another person that I want to help. And then, it yeah. and then it clicks into place. I think you need to be kind to yourself in a way that like, when you are marginalized, you rarely think of doing because mm -hmm. you always assume that you're subjugated to in like being insignificant. And I think that as someone who like, I'm there for a lot of my friends and my friends are there for me, like what advice would I give them, mm -hmm. you know, or would they give me, you know, like if they were in my shoots, like is my emotion, you know, rational mm -hmm. or like is my emotional response rational to the thing that I'm responding to? Wow. Well, thank you so much, Clara, for coming on the show. Yeah. Um, this was so Thanks great. Thanks so much for having me. Can you tell us where to find you or um, anything you want to promote? I know you have an article or if you want to plug your yeah. socials or anything like that. Yeah, I, um, I have my article linked in the description of my Instagram and TikTok, both of which the handles are at cjanover. Cool. And I'll link that in the description as well. Thanks, Clara. This is Thank Tell Me so Anything much. Pod. You can follow. Uh, yet, oh, sorry. Let me, uh, you can follow this podcast at Tell Me Anything Pod. Follow me at Larissa T on Twitter and Instagram. Thank you. Thank you.